Good morning. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And this is the first time we've ever done a second part to an episode. <laughs> a two-parter. <laughs> Uh-oh. And this is the second part to the new games coming out in 2021. Right? New RPGs. New RPGs. Because I'm sure there's tons oh, of more games coming no, out. No, we would never be able to finish that. <laughs> there were some other games that I wanted to talk about, but not necessarily too detailed. Cause His list is huge, people. Well, it's not huge. but So Iron Kingdoms uh, Requiem is a... What is that? It is a steampunk fantasy. Do you have that book? I oh. have an old version oh. of it. There's a new version coming out? Well, I have two old versions of it now. <laughs> so Iron Kingdoms uh, is a steampunk RPG, steampunk fantasy. Think of it. Uh, Which is a genre that Saul loves. Right. I do like steampunk. And, I, and fantasy is kind of a, it's kind of not my favorite, but it's pretty interesting because a lot of people don't like mixing their, because a lot of people don't like Shadowrun because they don't like mixing magic with their cyberpunk. It's not fun for oh, them. Oh, cyberpunk doesn't have magic? The original cyberpunk game, no. It's just, just a dystopian? Dystopian? Dytop- no, dys- I don't know what the hell I can't say. Dystopian? Today. Dystopian uh, uh, future, and there's no magic. It's cyberpunk. But Shadowrun, that's what makes it cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, throwing elves and dwarves and, di- and dragons. How could that not be fun? But I swear, a lot of people don't like that. Steampunk is uh is usually victorian era slightly altered history where people are able to make steam powered uh machines that clockwork stuff clockwork stuff that automatons they call them instead of robots that walk walk around they have a little you know mechanical things like robots and also depending on how how much from reality you want to get to they have like in, in iron iron kingdoms they have mechs steam powered mech you know big old huge yes. walker type things like i ima- imagine do they have a, zeppelins oh, of course okay yeah, yeah zeppelins is of course a, a must in any steampunk setting so i don't know i don't know originally what year iron kingdoms came out but i have a 2d20 system so that obviously says that it, it came out after 2001 during the d20 craze of the early 2000s where everybody just published anything and there was a lot of stuff now the difference between those and this uh, the iron kingdoms that that was put out is that the books were really well done they're really beautiful looking books they're not color you know know, not like it is these days where where a lot of fantasy uh, not fantasy but a lot of role-playing books have full color art and their pages are glossy or semi-glossy you know this is like regular old style books with black and white art but the cover is nice and they're hard covers there's two books one deals with the world and the one another one deals with uh with the character and character creation and character rules and stuff like that so it's kind of like the the player's handbook and the gm's guide kind of thing and so the new one is is published by who i don't know who's publishing the new one <laughs> it's i don't remember but it's gonna. I do know that it's gonna be kickstarted in in the in the spring. Oh, it's not even kickstarted yet. Not even kickstarted yet. I don't think. Oh, is it? I don't, I don't know. So. You're, you're the one that made the list. I did make the list. I don't have a note on whether. Of course, it's based on the fifth edition D and D. Now I'm gonna run uh, quite a few of these games that I list on my list are five edition fifth edition D and D iterations of the rules, which kind of scares me a little bit because I, I understand the idea and everybody says this I understand the idea of hitching your wagon to fifth edition D&D because fifth edition D&D is like crazy popular right it's probably the most popular D&D version to ever existed it is hugely making uh, hugely it is making huge sales still and uh, and it's been that way for a few years you know every year they say well D&D is finally going to take a dip in sales uh, and I don't think it has. I think there was a little period there in t- 2019 where it might have plateaued, but it plateaued at such a high level that it's like it's making a lot of money, right? So, of course, uh, if you're a small publisher and have these rules or this setting that you want to play in, you you know you might think about using the fifth edition rules as the base for your for your mechanic or using that set of rules, and that way people when you go to sell the game to people either on Kickstarter or get it published, you have that, what is it? That 
uh, recognition. Uh, yeah, recognition, <clears throat> right? Consumer recognition of oh, it's D and D fifth edition, set with these ru- uh, rules with with this setting. Immediately, the people already know how to play. You know, you have this huge player. Uh, what do you call it? Base. Player base, right? And uh, and I know, and and I'm and I know that that is a big deal for publishers, right? Because you want to sell as many books as you can, and they're looking at it economically. Now, sometimes I don't know if the genre fits the system. And, you know, I think D&D 5th edition is great for fantasy. And I don't think it's the, it's the end-all, be-all of all systems. I, you know, I think we should all remember the, two D, the, the, two D, the D20 craze of the early 2000s and how we ended up, well, not we, but people ended up with tons of books that they just couldn't sell. So... There you go. But I think if you have a good enough I'm idea. I'm not sure what you're saying. Well, I, th- I think. You're I, worried that too many people will use the, the fifth edition yeah, system and then nobody will buy it? Yeah, because I, I don't think the fifth edition is good rule set for everything. Right. Right. But. And and, and, I, and I think in the, in the D20 craze, people were just like putting sometimes crap, you know, crappy rules that you know weren't very well balanced and were you know, whatever, and stamping the two, the D20 logo on it and trying to sell it because that's the way it was. I mean, talk to anybody who owns, who owned a business back then, a hobby store, and how much D20 books they carried and how many D20 books they actually sold. I mean, I remember shortly after the D20 craze, probably about 2007, 2000. 2009 you were able to get a whole bunch of books well for yeah cheap <laughs> yes exactly and you would we would go to the to, to the conventions and go to the flea market and people would have like massive amount of milk crates of all kinds of d20 books, and they would sell them for like a dollar and still they weren't being sold because it wasn't all that good so there you go hopefully people won't make that same mistake i think uh certain companies uh for certain games like these guys they really love their game uh they're really tweaking the game to fit the fifth edition rules and like i said they have a fifth edition i mean they had a d20 version of it which was really well done and and then they came out with another version of it uh, the, the different company came out with a different version of it but was was which was really closely tied to the miniature game so it really played like a miniature game when it got into combat and stuff. But they were really beautiful books. Well, then it should work well with the D&D 5th edition <laughs> rules or any D&D rules. That's true. So Iron Kingdoms, if you like fantasy and you like steampunk and you like them mashed together, uh, this is a really good uh, good game for you. Coming out in 2021. Is it coming out in 2021 or is it getting kickstarted in 2021? I think it, it's both. They, they, they plan on having it out like within six months. Okay. But they all say that almost. Okay. And your next one? Stargate RPG. Ooh. Yes. Now, this is this is almost like repeat exactly what I said before about Iron Kingdoms. Stargate is going to be using the 5th edition rules. Okay. Right? Stargate had a previous edition using the D20 rules back okay. in the early 2000s. I have those books. They're really good. I And, and the, the good thing about the, the – well, the original Star Stargate – is that they were really well made books? They were really nice looking books. They were glossy, full color. They had pictures inside of them, of course, with the show, right? Yeah, right. So they had you know the the, the main characters on there and everything. And I never got to run it because I would nobody wanted to play it at the time. You know, I always wanted to play it, but I never got to play it because I would always go to the conventions where it was run, and a ton of people would want to play it. And now that now there's hardly any de- uh, Stargate games, but I'm guessing Stargate is going to come back in a big way. Uh, they kickstarted this in 2020, so the book should be published in 2021. Now I don't remember if I kickstarted this one. I don't think I did, because it was really successful. And what I like to do with my Kickstarter money, I like to support games that I think that may or may not, uh, uh, what do you call it, fund. And so I, I feel more. Uh, like I'm helping a you know a small company get published, if I you know if I put in for a Kickstarter that's not like super killing it right. Like if they're already like a thousand percent funded, I know that I'm gonna be able to find that book in a game store when it's finally when the Kickstarter is over, right? Because what happens is they offer you know most most Kickstarters offer a retail version, right? They go well if you're a retailer, we'll g- we'll sell you five books for a really low discounted price, and then you know they make sure that the person has a wholesale license or retail license or whatever and then they send them the books and so that's why 
I think uh, I didn't kickstart that one. But it's based on fifth edition rules, so there's levels. The problem I have is some certain genres for me doesn't make sense to have levels, like levels of type of character. You know. Well, um, Stargate would, would it would make sense? Why? Because as the more different worlds you go to, the more experience you're going to have. The more different. Ah, in that sense, yes. In, in the old D twenty uh, books, they came out with like a series guide, so it, there's a pretty thick uh, adventure guide. And it goes through every single well, at the t- at the time of publishing of every single episode in like a little synopsis. So it's of a genre them. specific. Oh yeah, Star Stargate. Stargate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, of course you can make up your own worlds and your own adventures, right? Which is, which was perfect for, for a role playing game. You know, you have this team of people that you put together and you send them to different places with certain goals in mind. Right. Right. Uh, another TV show, Altered Carbon. The Alter Carbon is you it's watch a TV it, show. <laughs> TV show on Netflix. It is a sort of sort of cyberpunk, but you know what? It, what it really is is it's called transhuman. Transhuman? I don't know what it is. The transhuman is not the word, but it's when you are able to do, to save your consciousness and put it in a different body. Ah. Uh-huh. Right. So in this game, in this show book uh, RPG, uh, you are able to. They call them sleeves. You are able to enter different bodies uh, depending on w- what your need, what is needed, right? And of course, you know, uh, it's, it's mega rich corporations. It's kind of cyberpunk, uh, dystopian uh, future where the have-nots are really have-nots, and the f- rich people are like ridiculously rich. And uh, and of course, the rich people are able to have sleeves, bodies that are either made by uh, uh, their clones, so they're perfect in every way, and while uh, other poor sleeve poor people can can keep their uh, th- they call it a core stack. It's like it's something that's like inserted into your spine or into the base of the neck, and that has all the memories and stuff of the body. And you can move that core stack to different bodies. So what what it so it's a very interesting world. It's very you know uh, it's reminiscent of a of a of a decaying world, but at the same time really rich world. And in the in the TV series, I only seen seen the first episode. I mean, the first season, the second season changes because it's a different character. And what's really interesting is that the 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 character. Now, how does it work? The character. I don't remember now. <laughs> I can't think of it. But it's a very interesting idea that you can switch with sleeves and bodies and get like a really strong uh, sleeve uh, that has a, a huge reaction. That has you know, kind of like cyber- cyberpunk, where they have you know grafted uh, muscles and stuff like that to make them quicker and and stuff like that so it's a really interesting show uh it's a really interesting uh, uh set of rules it's not based on fifth edition which is interesting it uses its own brand new system where you roll low instead of roll high ah. Ah. and you roll different di- different types of dice dice to make your attempt at your school roll so a d12 is the worst die you can roll because you're trying to roll low mm-hmm. where a d4 is the best okay that's about all I know about the system. You can go to alteredcarbon.net or whatever it is. I don't know where. Uh, but they have a That's quick, not very informational. Know, so, but you can look it up. You can look it up easy. Google you know, Altered Carbon RPG. It will take you to either the, I think, uh, the, Kickstart, the Kickstart page at the very least. And there, there's a link to the Quick Start rules. So you can actually check out the game with pre-gens, with an adventure, and check it out. Almost all these you can do that with. So Altered Carbon, something I'm looking forward to. Like I said, it's based on a TV show. Yeah, kind of interesting. Uh, another one is Interface Zero 3.0. Now, Interface Zero is a cyberpunk game. Uh, it came out for, I think it came out for uh, Savage Worlds. And it and it and then it came out with, it. I think it might have come out with its own rules. And then it, now uh, 3.0 is back to Savage Worlds using the new Suede edition or Adventures Edition that just came out maybe a year ago. Or so. Or so. You know, I don't know if, how many of you have the same problem, but 2020 doesn't seem like a year. Cause, <laughs> and at the same time, it seems longer than a year. So it's kind of this weird uh, feeling. But Interface Zero is a cyberpunk game. It has its own own kind of a, has a, quite a bit, bit of a setting. It was really popular for a while, but with the new edition of uh, Savage Worlds, they coming out with a new edition of 
interface zero. I know you have your list there, but oh yeah, th- you were telling me about the game called Dune. Dune, yes, Dune uh, is being published by by uh, Modifius, I believe, two D twenty system, and uh, and I don't know much about it. I I don't think it's even been has it been kickstarted yet. I don't think so. I think they're still working on it. And uh, Modifius is a really good company. If you like their two D twenty system and you like their books in the past, I'm sure they're going to come out with beautiful looking books. You know, John Carter, the maps on on it are, are nice. You know, everything is just, they're really good at hitting the feeling of the book, of the genre with the book, right? So John Carter, the books are really nice. They're really weird. Uh, and they use, the, the, only, the only thing is they, they change the profile, so they, they, they're they really long. Uh, a lot of people don't like that, but I thought it was fitting that it would be different. Really long? What do you, you know, mean? They're, they're long instead of, you know, it's eight and a half by 11, uh-huh. but instead of being tall, you they're landscape edition. Kinda, okay. Kind of, that's how they're, that's what it is. Okay. Like I said, I don't know too much about it. I read Dune. I don't know if I, I've ever talked about Dune. As in, I think I was like 13. And I don't think I was smart enough or had the concept. I don't know. My brain wasn't quite fully developed enough to understand it. Or I was really confused during that book because there's a lot of thought speech. I don't know, have you read it? No, I avoided Dune. Yeah, and there's a lot of thought speech, which when I was younger, I was like, because the thought speech was in italics. That was the only difference. And I'm like, why is this in italics? I was thinking. And then I'm like, oh, they're thinking. And then I was like, and I couldn't remember. Sometimes, you know, as a 13-year-old, I couldn't keep track of what, well, was this, did this person say that or they think that? You know, and it was just, it was really hard for me to understand. There you go. But I like the story. The story behind it was really neat. And the things that Frank Herbert wrote a good book. But like I said, I was just really complicated. The movies, I've only seen the, the movie with uh, Sting. And I can't stand that freaking Baron Har- Harkonnen or Harkonnen, that big fat blob that floats around. But suppo- that's exactly how it is, he described it, and it was just really gross. I am a little bit we- wary of of a whole role playing game that takes place a uh, space, uh, a futuristic uh, science fiction game taking place on one planet. But you know, most adventures and most games take place on one planet, so maybe I'm being too critical of it. Uh, there's probably plenty of stories to tell about Dune other than the story of Paul Atreides, the main character who, I don't know, he frees Dune or frees the Freeman or something. I don't know. It's been a long time since I read it. It's been a long time since I watched the movie. I have not watched the the, the newer one version. Some people hate it. Some people like it. I should watch it because I do, I, do like, I do like science fiction, but I haven't seen that movie. So, yeah, there it is. And another one you were telling me about was the One Ring. There's the a one new ring, edition. Second edition. Oh my God! So I really truly love the One Ring. Even Jolene refuses to play that with us. Uh, I don't know why. She loves Token. She loves uh, the the setting, and maybe she thinks we'll ruin it for her. I don't know. But uh, we've been playing the One Ring for about two, three years now. I hate to say, it seems that long. Probably longer. Uh, it was the, one of the first games we started playing. When I gathered my ragtag group of people who, who play at Stanford, you know, ragtag group, and uh, you know, we eat uh, brie cheese and uh, and stuff there. It's only because Cowie feeds you well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so thank goodness for Cowie, uh, our host at the time uh, when we used to meet face to face, and uh, I think I started running the One Ring, and Bay really likes running the One Ring, so we co GM, you know. We don't really me- have a meeting of the minds and say, oh, we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. I just told him my basic idea of what I wanted to do with the campaign. And that's all I did. I didn't say, well, you have to follow my ideas or anything. But he seems to be running. You know, we seem to be running fine together. Uh, we trade off and on, though. I think he's been pl- he's ran a couple games more than I have now because I really like playing the game. The One Ring is a really cool system. It's not. Fifth edition rules. It's its own, very own system. It's very unlike uh, D and D in a sense. I like the way they deal with with uh, r- with armor. I like what they deal with with uh, fatigue and hit points. They don't have hit points. They got this thing called fatigue. Uh, I like everything about it. It's a little wonky, you know, the rules about combat rules. That's okay, because the second edition might change just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I don't think well. 
Okay. So then th- there's been a little bit of a problem because the One Ring was originally published by uh, Cubicle, Seven. Cubicle Seven, which I think is a fabulous publisher. I love the books that they've put out. They, they're really nice. They were working on the second edition. And they were working on it, working on it. And then all of a sudden, there was a dispute about a contractual dispute about obviously had to do with money and the person who owns the the ability to the rights the rights to lord you know, of the rings the lord to post lord of the rings uh, middle earth uh not lord of the rings middle earth uh, uh rpg belongs to oh my god i can't remember but it belongs to a certain studio and basically i think uh Somebody wanted more money or something happened along those lines and and the publisher Cubicle Seven couldn't pay it or didn't want to pay it, so they lost the rights to to publish the game. Even though they had worked on it quite a bit. I mean they were like they were sending out pictures of pages and mm-hmm. what they were look like and it looked like it was gonna get published in twenty twenty. Uh so so it was really uh uh disheartening to see that it wasn't gonna get done by Cubicle Seven. Uh, the the person who owned the rights, I think I don't have a one book ha- book ha- one ring book handy, but I know what I'm gonna go get one. So the owner of the rights of Sophisticated Games, and the publisher was uh, Cubicle Seven, and I believe Francesco Nipatello, who was the writer, either either is very heavily is owner of Sophisticated Games, or anyway, so he starts shopping around to get a publisher, to get a publisher, and uh, he found somebody, uh, Free League. And it's Free League, yes. Free League is coming out. So according to everything that they've written and I've heard and read is that it's not going to be a massive change in the rules. Free League is not going to adapt New Year Zero. Year Zero. Year Zero engine. They're not going to adapt it to the Year Zero engine. It's going to be tweaks of the rules and you're still be able to, supposed to use the old rules or the old uh, books uh, in the new second edition, which is... It, uh, is a sigh of relief for you know thousands of players that play this game. It certainly makes me happy. There's just like I said, the 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 book is now out of out, out of print, print because Cubicle Seven literally uh, legally could had could not sell any more of the books as of uh, sometime in in July or June of 2020, uh, and so the only place you could find it is in the aftermarket eBay, you know, used bookstores or bookstores if they still have uh, product. And if you buy it on eBay, a lot of people are over the books are way overpriced. So, well, once it goes out of print, that always happens. Yeah. And legally, the, the the publisher couldn't. If yeah. they had stuff in the warehouse, they could still sell. It, but now legally, they cannot sell it. So I'm really excited to see the uh, the second edition come out. I think it should be really fun for us who play the game. I think it's a really good system, and I think uh, a new uh, a new edition is, hopefully will bring more players and give this uh, game a a good shot in the arm for players, for more players to play. Because I really do, really like the system. And the, those are people who are afraid that, well, you know, I don't want to redo the, you know, I don't want to play the Lord of Rings, you know, be Frodo and stuff. And there's, you know, there's no way, not no way, but you don't have to play those. There's plenty of stories to tell in Middle Earth that have nothing to do with the One Ring. And and some people have done some pretty amazing things in this in this the rules the way it's written it takes place five years after the war of the five rings so it takes place between the hobbit and the lord of the rings between when you know five years after uh bilbo gets home well after uh finding the ring and before uh frodo leaves on his quest and now in a few just going by the movies it wasn't like six months or something like that. It was like, according to the to the book, I think it was forty three years between those two events happening. So there's quite a bit of time that you have to play with, and uh, and depending on how you want to look at the canon of the of the of the stories, you know, for me, canon, I throw it out the window. If uh, if they accidentally kill Frodo and Sam uh, while they're running well, around, why the would woods, you have Frodo and Sam in it? I'm just saying. Then, you know, Frodo and Sam die and, and they have to deal with the ring. That's the way it works. I'm just kidding. But you know, what I'm saying is is that the players can impact the world and not have to worry about messing up canon. Right. For me. Other people, not so much. But for me. Okay, before you go on for another 25 minutes on this particular yes. b- game, yes. um, what about 
Pendragon. I hear there's a sixth, sixth edition, edition coming yes. out by Chaosium. So supposedly, well, not supposedly, but I believe him. Uh, who's the creator? Uh, Greg, Greg Stafford. Stafford has been working on the sixth edition for like 10 years, right? Uh, been reworking the rules, doing all kinds of tweaks. Now, uh, fifth edition came out. I don't remember when fifth edition came out, but they came out with the fifth edition five one well, five point two, which was somebody redid the they redid the the rules, just minor tweaks to the rules. They redid the art. The five point two book is really pretty, beautiful art inside and out, and it's a really nice put together book. This one says that it's the 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 that Pendragon veterans will like this one because it's the fundamentally the game remains the same. But it's just ten years of of um, Greg Stafford tweaking the rules just to make them a little bit better. Yes. So yeah, exactly. And and I and I you know welcome that kind of thing. Greg Stafford passed away. It's been like two years now. You know he was an amazing. You know he was an amazing guy. I, unfortunately, I never got to meet him or talk to him. Uh, even though he was actually at at a couple of conventions that I frequented years ago. Uh, he would go to Dungeon Con because he was local, and uh, his company was here in Berkeley, so you know, Chaosium, and uh, and he was friends with my our other friend uh, Larry Detilio, who passed away also uh, before that, and he wrote the Mask of Nakalakatep, right? So, <laughs> yeah, Sorry, but, people, for but, butchering so, that. So I was I was lucky to to be in this area and be involved with people that knew him. You know, like you know, Roderick, you know, Robertson. Robertson knows him. You know, almost everybody and the staff of uh, Dunder Khan. Dunder Khan knows him, and uh, you know, I I am now Facebook friends with this guy called uh, Peter Corliss, who is who actually owned the rights to publish uh, the rules for uh, a couple years, and you know, and all these guys and all these people, I should say, are really steeped in the, in the world of. Uh, of what he created, you know that you know Roderick has a character in uh, in uh, in the Pendragon rules, and that's how important it was for him to. Uh, uh, that's how much he was involved in in Stafford's life. I think. I think you know. I, if I'm going to share a story, I think Roderick said that that when. Are, Greg, you, are you sure you're allowed to share this story? <laughs> I don't know. I think so. I, you know, I think uh, uh, Roderick gave him money to start Chaosium right when he first started, and. Because, you know, Roderick was young. He didn't have any bills. You know, he was making good money doing whatever he was doing. And so he started, you know, he helped him. You know, he wasn't the only person to help him. But and 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 Greg Stafford paid him back. And it was like and Roderick really, you know, that was the kind of character he was. You know, some people, you know, they forget. They forget how much, you know, how when you help him out and uh, and don't pay you back, you know, money that is owed. And, and that's unfortunate. But, you know, Greg Stafford wasn't that kind of person. Anyway, and the anyway, new sorry. game. The new game. I don't know much about sixth edition, but uh, I think uh, anybody who plays uh, Pendragon will probably buy the book, uh, no doubt. I'm to, sure they will. Uh, to, like uh, the reports say, you know, it's not a revamping of the rules. It's still the same core set of rules, which I find very interesting and very compelling to, for role playing, because it makes you role play not necessarily how you would want to, but just the way the character is made. Right. You know, with the whole passions and, and yeah. prejudices or whatever it is. And I know that we've that this episode might go a little bit longer, but there's one other game one other one that I wanted to talk about and I know you still have some on your yes. list. But I found this fascinating to read that Pathfinder is coming out with a Savage or Savage Worlds and Pathfinder yes. are coming out with a version right. of Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. <laughs> and I just want to know <laughs> what is that about? what does that mean? Okay, so Pathfinder the book, the the rule, the publisher, the uh, Pai Paizio, Paizio, whatever. I think, to be honest, they're taking a beating trying to beat fifth edition, right? So, but they also have this huge catalog of of adventures, of of campaigns, and stuff like that, and and it's a really interesting deal. I mean, this is like big news. A lot of people were shocked. Uh, a lot of Savage Worlds people are going like, why? You know, wh why are you doing this? But I think what it does, it helps both companies. Now, Savage Worlds doesn't have a a, a homebrew. You know, it is a, a generic system, right? You put whatever setting you want on it, and then and then 
and and then the rules will handle anything you throw at it. Now they have a fantasy companion book, I think it's called. Uh, fortunately, I think it was out of print, but I don't know. I'm not sure about that anymore. And what would happen was, if you want to run a a fantasy game, you would run, you would buy the the core book of 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 uh, Savage Worlds, and then you would buy this fantasy companion, which included rules for how to make elves in the game and dwarves. And all it is is like, well, you know. If you're gonna have a dwarf, he's gonna have this this uh, uh, this feat or or uh, what do you call it? Uh, let me think. <laughs> trait. Yes, <laughs> it would have this trait or or this effect in the game, right? Because the original rules they had some examples of that, but they didn't have a complete example of how to make trolls or how to make this and you know th- everything that would be needed to run a fantasy game. Unless they showed you how to do it, so I guess you were on your own to make it. But we're here. They're going to give you a complete uh, Savage Worlds fantasy campaign that's based on the on the on the ideas of Pathfinder. So it says that the Pathfinder and Savage Rules core book rule core rule book will include an adaptation of Savage Worlds game mechanics for players to make and evolve characters and for game masters to create their own design for play in Pathfinder's world of Galarian. Galarian, yes. So that's interesting. So they're going to take Pathfinder and put it into so people that so play setting. Savage Worlds all the time can. Yeah. The setting will be there and you can use the Savage World rules. And they're also going to have the action deck templates, a game master screen. Yeah. You with an adventure. Whole, you got to have everything. Power cards. It's only it's being kickstarted in early 2021. So. Yes. so it'll be I'm sure it'll fund. Oh, uh, well, actually, it was already kickstarted. I mean, it was already, I don't know when it ends, but um, its release is in 2021. So oh, okay. I'm sure it won't. If it didn't fund already, I'm, I'm sure, sure it will. I'm soon. sure it will. Uh, and the thing is, like, some people poo pooed the idea. You know, poo pooed. The Savage Worlds uh, uh, traditionalist, so I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, there's always going to be negative people. And I think, I think it's only a good thing, right? Savage Worlds gets a kick in the arm with a solid setting of fantasy which it really doesn't i mean they ha- they they're like open gaming license right yes yes so th- so other people can come up with with all kinds of settings but with the publishing uh know-how of, i'm of pretty Hyazo, sure that people that that play savage worlds may have played pathfinder so this would be like a really cool thing if they didn't like the crunchiness of pathfinder they can bring it into their own their own um rule system without now. having to homebrew so much yes right i think it's a good idea i think it's a good great uh and I, I like would, I like Pathfinder. It's very crunchy in the fact of all the numbers you have to deal with, but um, but I think it'll be cool. I actually had that listed on my list. That's going to be an interesting uh, set of rules to look at and see how popular it becomes, especially for Savage Worlds because Savage Worlds does really good, but it doesn't have the might or power of uh, of D and D right or popularity. And I'm not to say power or might, but and uh, it's a totally different set of rules, a totally different idea of of, of what what an RPG should be like. All I know is trying to make a character, unless someone tells you what you can use or not use is really hard in that thing. <laughs> With the, well, I looked at their rule book and it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so just real quick, I wanted to talk about werewolf, the fifth edition coming out. I've never played werewolf. Okay. I played werewolf twice, uh, both times at a convention. Uh, it was, it was really fun. Uh, I never got into the whole, any of the white wolf uh, books, the v- vampire, werewolf, and all that stuff. I think people in the '90s who were maybe a little bit younger than me really got into it because they were like it was the whole goth era. They liked you know wearing makeup, wearing trench coats, and stuff like that. I, I never did. I was busy going to school, working, so I never got. I wasn't a, a teen, teen or late teen, a teenager uh, in the '90s. So I missed out on the boat. Uh, I know it's it was uh, the whole series of books was supremely popular. Mage the Ascension, Zombie, Wrath the Oblivion, you know, all those books were, were popular, and uh, and Werewolf was a, a, another popular book, uh, another probably the second most popular book system, you know, from White Wolf. People really love playing the werewolves and the whole intrigue of the different tribes and all that stuff. So it was interesting. So that's coming out. I want to tr- throw something that I don't, I don't know, I don't normally play called uh, po- as a game powered by the po- apocalypse called Root, which is based on a a board game where 
uh, woodland animals fight against each other in political intrigue and war. They've convert, made that into an RPG. Powered by the Apocalypse. I'm not completely a fan of Powered by the Apocalypse, but then again, I don't think I've really played in a game that was really well run. So, there you go. So there's a ton of more games out there that are coming out in 2021. You're lucky that there's a, there's always a ton of games, but this, I think, is a really good batch of games. If you go to Ian World, they have a list of the games That's coming out. That's E-N World. Yeah, the letters E, the letter N, and World. And if you go to their forums or their website, they have a list of games that won in the pa- in the past years. So you'll you'll see if uh, if they're any good or if they're any uh, are they correct as to f- how how uh, popular those games. If were. you've played those games, yeah, because they, basically they have a contest, uh, not a contest. They have a survey, whatever you call it, and people put put the the top three games they're looking forward to, and then they they publish that that list on popularity. So now that Saul has taken two episodes to tell you all the games that he might like to have in 2021 might buy um go have fun yes this is gaming perspectives with saul and jolene you have a good day